The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now Jesus stood before the governor who questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? But he did not answer him one word, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had handed him over. While he was still seated on the bench, his wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. I suffered much in a dream today because of him. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, but to destroy Jesus. The governor said to them in reply, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They answered, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, When Pilate saw that he was not succeeding at all, but that a riot was breaking out instead, he took water and washed his hands in the sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Look to it yourselves. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But after he had Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus inside the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped off his clothes and threw a scarlet military cloak about him. Weaving a crown out of thorns, they placed it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, They spat upon him and took the reed and kept striking him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, They gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Immediately one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and putting it on a reed gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, 
But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The centurion and the men with him who were keeping watch over Jesus feared greatly when they saw the earthquake and all that was happening, and they said, This time from the beginning of Lent through Easter Sunday is marked with a rapid succession of external rituals in the life of a Catholic. We remember Ash Wednesday when we received the blessed ashes on our foreheads. Today we receive palm branches and we fold them into neat little crosses. You'll also notice that the crucifix and the statues are veiled with purple cloth. That's a symbol of the Lord hiding from persecution until when his hour has come. It's also a symbol of the church uh, liturgically dying with Christ so that she may rise with him to new life on Easter. And so you have the paring down of all of these aspects of the liturgy, um, the Alleluia, the, um, the use of the organ outside of singing, um, the uh, veils, the stripping of the altar on Good Friday, etc. On Holy Thursday, we have the foot washing, another uh, rich symbol in these coming rituals. On Good Friday, we kneel and kiss the cross. On Saturday night, the Easter vigil is filled with incense, chants, uh, acclamations, water and oil and light. All of these, even the deadening silence and the emptiness of the altar on Good Friday, are rich experiences that flood our senses. It somehow makes sense that we um, come in larger um, attendance to these ceremonies than we do on the common Sundays throughout the year. Our Lord made us to be sensing beings, and He uses our senses to help us to know Him. But what will we do when Easter is over and the rest of the, and the, rest of the liturgical year marches on? What will we do when all of the sensational things give way to the sobriety and noble simplicity that often marks the Holy Mass? We've been re-examining our faith throughout this season of Lent, but now we are called to re-examine our faith in the light of these rich symbols that are upon us. We must remember that all the external rituals of our faith are not ends in and of themselves. They're supposed to remind us of the deeper spiritual realities that they signify. Religious sentiments are good and appropriate in response to these beautiful things that we will see because those sentiments often serve to invite us to go uh, deeper, to enter more fully into our faith. But our experiences of these things should not stop at the external level or the level of sentiment. We must consider the underlying spiritual effect that is taking place. What the ashes mean. What the palm branches mean. What the foot washing and the cross, the water, the oil and light what those mean, what difference they make for our faith. We're made for deeper realities, for solemnity. We're made for transcendence. Deep down, we're all longing for something greater than ourselves. Some of the Jews of Jesus' time, though, they were only caught up with the spectacle of things, with the spectacle of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They had not let him enter deeply into their hearts. St. Matthew describes how his persecutors spat in his face and struck him, while some slapped him, saying, Prophesy for us, Christ, who is it that struck you? Later they jeered at him, Let him come down from the cross now. 
and we will believe in him. Of course, they had no faith in him, and they had no deeper interest in prophecy or miracles. They're only concerned with the external signs and wonders. Today, our Lord processes triumphantly into Jerusalem, not upon a team of war horses along a path of gold, but on a peaceful colt and donkey along a path of cloaks and palm branches. This he did to the shouts of praise of a very large crowd. But only a few days later, this same group, riled up by the high priests, will shout for his crucifixion. Pilate said to them, What shall I do with Jesus called Christ? Why crucify him? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Let him be crucified. It's easy to shout with praise and acclamation to Jesus, as they did at his entry on those branches, when everyone else around us is shouting praises too. But when the people disperse enough ill will, are we quick to condemn him? Do I preach Christ and him crucified only when I'm surrounded by attentive parishioners or brother priests? What do I say to those who disagree with church teaching? or who try to persecute the church? What about when I'm with friends or family and my guard is down? Do I praise him still? How can we live differently today because of the scenario that is unfolded before us? You and I have to make sure that our faith doesn't stop at the externals. If we live our lives no deeper than the surface level, then we are easily swayed by those who have the loudest voice. But when we allow the external signs of our faith to take us deeper, then we come to know the truth of our faith, and we come to know Christ for who he really is. Then Christ can begin to mold and transform us into Catholics who are always faithful, always at his right hand, even if we are the only ones standing up for him, even when there is darkness over the whole land. If we can go deeper, we can be Catholics who wear ashes to show contrition, who wash feet to honor the commandment to love, who are sprinkled with water to reclaim our baptism, who receive oil to be sanctified, healed, and strengthened, and who light candles to show the world that Christ is the light. We never use symbols because that's just what we've always done. We use them because their deep and underlying meanings make us holy and glorify God. We use them because they flow from our faith and stir up our faith. We use symbols in order to be empowered to stay true to Him.